of engendering creativity in a person. And I thought that maybe if you talk a little bit about where you draw your creative energy, that might help us understand about where we can find it in all of us. In the shower. <laughs> Every morning in the shower. <laughs> Truly. That's it. In the those hot water four or five minutes does it, and then I'm all set for the day. Well, that's really good. Okay, so we're good, right? We're all going to be fine with this. Amazing. You came to, you, but you've, you've had a background, before you turned to arts administration and management, you really, you were engaged yourself in theater. No, no, not at all. I was, uh, the only thing I ever did was be a singer. I was a singer, that was it. Um, so I never really did theater. I did a couple high school plays, but uh, I was not a theater person. And why did you decide to do this? I didn't want to go to law school after I drove there. <laughs> And I went back to Utica, where I went to college, and went, now what the hell do I do? And my dad said, he was here, come work in our business, in his family business. And I went, I don't want to do that. But I don't know what I want to do. So I painted houses for a summer and did some roofing. And That'll turn you to another career, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then this, uh, this arts administration thing, which I had done in college for my college scholarship work was pretty fun, and I looked for a job and got one. And I was there for 25 years in Chautauqua County. Huh. And then here. Do you know what I think made a big difference to me? Living yeah. in New Haven. Really? New Haven has been the hotbed of, of trying to imagine cities in America since 1950. You have all the intellect of Yale and all the disaster of what goes on around New Haven and its poverty and its education issues and everything else. And you'd see all these great ideas come out of New Haven. None of them ever really worked. <laughs> but they kept coming. Uh -huh. And I kept watching going, wow, there's got to be a way for cities to work. And it just struck me these things came together somehow. The arts, culture, and urban life. And in a sense, Schenectady is like a smaller version of New Haven, isn't it? And oh yeah, absolutely. I can't imagine doing this in a suburb in Florida. I don't want to do it. <laughs> when, uh, uh, how do you uh, maintain a creative vision when I imagine so much of your job must engage with uh, budgets and administration and so on? How do you maintain your, your creative edge? It, it's everywhere. People want things to happen. They all want good things to happen. So I don't know, I think it's easy because people always have ideas and they're coming up and going, why don't we try this? Or staff is coming up with great ideas or, you know, we have a problem, we've got to fix it. Okay, let's fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so to me it's easy because it's everywhere. The opportunity was when the city hit rock bottom, when there was a metroplex and a methodology to think and talk about change, and when there was an opportunity to kind of go, well, let's just do it because it's there. Let's just put the pipe in the ground for snow melt. And it was only because the concrete was ripped up. And all right, all right, we'll put the pipe in the ground. And Dan Sheen and I put the pipe in the ground. Um, really? 
Yeah, <laughs> really, because they're just when you hit rock bottom, you're willing to think about all kinds of things, and that's what the community was willing to do. I think just the fact that we did all this is an unusual story based on the fact that we were in a place that was willing to consider all kinds of things. Well, it was an amazingly brave thing to do. You don't get a theater that tears off everything behind the proscenium arch. This is a, uh, this was a bold action. And that is a real tribute to the people who have made this place what it is over the years. Right? Many of whom are right here. Many of whom are here, yeah. It's a very strong statement of confidence in the community and hope. It's a really wonderful I will thing. never forget, as, what, as I was hired, uh, Lionel Barthold, who was mentioned here, who was here tonight, uh, turned to me as he toasted me with a glass of scotch in his yard, in his home, with his bride, Debbie. And uh, he said, everything's teed up. We just need somebody with a good swing. <laughs> That's a great thing. A man can swing. This is great. Well, and if you, Philip, were to say, okay, five, ten years, you know, you're a very young man, and so you may be at this for a while longer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just saying to somebody that I have enough college loans left, I'm at it for a long time. <laughs> So, uh, what do you see down the road? What do you think are the challenges that continue to confront this organization and this community as you look forward, if you could see a decade into the future? Well, as many people have heard or have said many times, the, for the region to get strong, we've got to have the cultural leg of the stool. We have the academic leg of the stool. We have the healthcare leg of the stool. And the cultural leg of the school, stool isn't there yet. We, we, all of us, are not strong enough. And that probably means crossing more boundaries like CapRep and Proctors. And we're talking about, a con we're having a conversation about the Universal Preservation Hall in Saratoga. And it means other organizations crossing some boundaries probably. And a half a dozen or five organizations becoming as strong as the kinds of organizations that would be in a city like a Pittsburgh or a Buffalo are. And until we get to that place, I don't think we're going to be able to have that third leg of the stool. And is there, um, is there a, a path toward that? Is Mobu, for example, a step on that path? Uh, what do you Absolutely. Think? 45 groups talking to one another. Even if the events themselves flounder, 45 groups talking. <laughs> Well, you know, Philip, we have a special treat for you here this evening. Actually, it's a treat for the uh, for the audience too, uh, because uh, the uh, one of the important things uh, of uh, of Philip's tenure here clearly is his emphasis on engaging youth in the arts, and so we're going to take a, a look. Uh, through another uh, Proctor's creative team effort. I should mention that first uh, video is a wonderful project created by Proctor's staff. We're going to look at another little video here about the importance of our youth being exposed and engaged in the arts. Let's take a look at what Proctor's is doing with young people. Families throughout the capital region's 14 counties and into Massachusetts and Vermont. Ten years ago, Proctors expanded that initiative to make it an even more significant part of the theater's mission and strategic vision. Education programming is developed in collaboration with school districts, colleges, artists, and arts organizations, and is designed to focus on community needs. The programs now reach over 40,000 students, teachers, and youth each season. In addition to a schedule of diverse performances, Proctor's Education Department hosts community events, summer arts institutes, school performances, giant screen films, in-school and in-theater workshops, artist residencies, after-school and media arts programs, with a special dedication to at-risk and underserved youth, and with a budget that puts a special emphasis on grants and sponsorships. The Education Department presents nearly 400 events each season through 12 distinct and diverse programs. Programs that are held to the highest possible arts and education standards and which undergo continuous evaluation 
to ensure that the highest quality is delivered with the most significant impact. videos, Zeb Schmidt of the Proctor's Base Open Stage Media, which provides government access to you. Thank you so much. And now, here's a special presentation. The, and so I'm going to, while you're here in your living room, you're going to have a couple of other things that are happening here. And one of them is, I'm going to uh, bring you over to the podium first here, and we're going to welcome the President of Cool Insuring and the President of the Proctor's Board, Tony Mashuda. Let's go over here. Philip Morris, a man who, who so richly deserves all of the honor, the accolades, and the attention that he is being given this evening, because this organization, Proctors, would be nowhere near where it is today without his 10 years of guidance. I'm here to talk about uh, education and about scholarship, but first I wanted to say a couple other things. Um, I was really excited when I heard about uh, the UnGala. I'm not a very formal person. I don't really like to get dressed up formally. I have two tuxes in the closet that I never wear. The fact that they don't fit me anymore has nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, I really like the idea, and hopefully everyone here does too, and we can create a tradition of being comfortable. I did have one disappointment, though, today. I was getting ready, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to wear. And I knew that it was going to be casual for the ungala theme. But I wanted to also do something to honor Philip. And I was trying to dress appropriately and accordingly. But I looked through my entire wardrobe, my entire closet. I even looked through my wife's closet. <laughs> I couldn't find that one piece of clothing that incorporated red, pink, yellow, blue, and green. I just couldn't find that. It just wasn't there. I'm sure you will. Uh, but anyway, what I'm here to do is to just say a few words about our scholarship. Um, opportunities and to let people know all about the program. Uh, this is really near and dear to me because as Philip knows and I think a lot of other people that know me know, too many people don't really understand what Proctors is, what we do, what we stand for, and how we are much more than a uh, Broadway theater that puts on productions of Broadway shows. I kind of cringe when uh, I hear that, well, you guys put on Broadway theater. Well, yeah, we do, but really that's only one small aspect of what we are and how we touch the community and all of the things that really make us the organization that we are. And again, we owe all of that to Philip. He has really, he is a true visionary. And I made a comment uh, to a reporter, and it really is so true. What's it like working with Philip? And it was quoted in the Gazette. It's like catching a tiger by the tail. You just hang on and go for the ride. <laughs> With that, I just wanted to talk about our um, education and scholarship 
opportunities. Every year, Proctors promotes several scholarship funds established to allow for underserved schools, classrooms, and individuals to participate in education programs. From show tickets to transportation, no school or individual is ever turned away for lack of funds. Proctor's team facilitates over $70,000 in scholarships every year. This is a mandate that comes from Philip and has become a critical component of our education program. Last year alone, scholarships impacted 9,200 students. These scholarships not only allow for extraordinary opportunities for the youth, but enable us to build relationships with the schools, the children, and the families that use them. Some examples of scholarship funds use are allowing students to participate in our School of the Performing Arts, allowing students to participate in our after-school programs, allowing students to participate in an artist workshop, allowing students to attend the Broadway production, allowing students to participate in our media programs. Every program that we offer allows for scholarships. Applications are always accessible on our website or by contacting someone in Proctor's Education Department. And if you haven't seen our unauction giving opportunities, the easels in the back, please go find them uh, during dinner and please be generous with your gifts. Thank you very much. Now I have the distinct pleasure of honoring Philip with a gift from the Proctor's Theater Guild. This awesome creation is by Jeff Boyer of the Times Union. You'll all want to take a look at this uh, when you come up for dinner and uh, look at some of the details of it. I should just uh, point out there's a uh, box of bulk eyeglasses there. <laughs> there's a cell phone in his hand. What would that be? It's, a, it's an iPhone. And uh, yes, Volkswagen RIP. Yes, indeed. <laughs> all right. So, and one more special treat. Philip, if you'd like to take your seat again, please, on the sofa. Um, uh, now, if I sit here, I'm going to feel like Dr. Freud, but... <laughs> anyway, <laughs> tell us. Actually, the fact is, uh, there, there are a number of remarkable talents working for Proctors, and the creativity that's uh, present here all the time is a wonderful thing. But what we're going to present now is a special treat for you. Uh, my favorite Albany Pro Musica colleague, actually, uh, offering us uh, some selection for the upcoming Proctor's season. Uh, somebody from the CEO's office of Proctor's, Songs That Speak to the Inimitable Philip Morris. Ladies and gentlemen, with a serenade for our honoree, here's Gene Leonard. Thank you. 
Gene put it in words better than any of the rest of us could. I'm sure the music, but then he was put it into words for sure. So, Philip, I think it's these people deserve to have a little dinner at this point, don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Here comes something really special now. This curtain's going to rise, and you all are going to come up and take your place on this beautiful Proctor stage for the Ungaler. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, well, come on.